and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top-selling games from January 1990. I take a look at Carnell Software. I review some games and finish with a map. But first, here's the news. Yes, 1990 has arrived, and the Spectrum is now nearing the end of its life, and the magazines are beginning to get thinner and thinner, just like the news stories. Many of the magazines are now putting out cover tapes, giving some older games a new audience. Crash include Eskimo Eddie, an old ocean title, along with Jason's gem from Mastertronic. Your Sinclair are giving away Cat Trap from Demarc, along with an unreleased game called Nightmare on Robinson Street. Some of these games may be familiar to old players, but some new people to the Spectrum may not have seen them before, and it's a good way to introduce them to some of the classic titles. New games announced this month include Scrambled Spirit, the arcade conversion from Grand Slam, P47, another arcade conversion, this time from Microprose, and Hot Rod, yes, another arcade conversion, this time from Activision. Magnetic Scrolls, the creators of some of the best adventures on the Spectrum and other machines, have signed a distribution deal with Virgin Mastertronic, this should allow all those wonderful games to be made more readily available. Talking of Virgin Mastertronic, they have just released a compilation of games especially for the Magnum Light Phaser Light Gun. This pack will sell for just $1.99 and includes games like Billy the Kid, Bronx Street Cop, F-16 Fighting Falcon, US Turbo King and Jungle Warfare. Yes, the very same games that were produced for the Cheetah Defender Light Gun in a special Codemasters deal. Obviously not much conversion work required to get these to a different gun. Amazingly, Infograms have announced that they plan to release a huge 16-bit title, Sim City, on the Spectrum. Taking control of land and slowly building up the infrastructure, eventually getting to the city, complete with transport network and utilities, seems an impossible task on the Spectrum. But the company claim they will have it ready by summer. That's just seven months away. Good luck to them. And that was the news. And now onto the top selling games. At number 5 is Cabal, or Cabal from Ocean Software. At number 4, Power Drift from Activision. Number 3, Untouchables from Ocean. At number 2, Robocop from Ocean. And at number one, Batman the Movie from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling games from January 1990. Before we start this feature, it's important to note that the dates of the early game releases are not 100% confirmed. In a popular Computing Weekly interview, Roy Carnell and Stuart Galloway claim to have written Volcanic Dungeon before Black Crystal. However, Volcanic Dungeon is also claimed to be the second game in the Third Continent series, the first being The Black Crystal. The games and instructions say nothing to help. The earliest adverts for Black Crystal are two months before Volcanic Dungeon too, so make of that what you will. Maybe they wrote the ZX81 version of Volcanic Dungeon first, then the Black Crystal for both ZX81 and Spectrum, and then pushed out the Spectrum version of Volcanic Dungeon to complete things. Anyway, on to the story then. Ray Carnell and Stuart Galloway were both adventure fans before the term became popular and synonymous with computer gaming. They both collected fantasy fanzines and watched cheap, low-budget B-movies whenever they could. From there, they went on to make their own board games and even amateur movies. And this took them into the world of movie production, with both attending the film school in Birmingham, eventually working in the film industry in special effects. When the ZX81 came along in 1981, they both wanted to write games based on their love of all things fantasy, and so in November 1981 Carnell Software was born. Their first game, Volcanic Dungeon, was written on a 16K ZX81 and was sold via mail order only. In between their work in the film industry, they moved over to the Spectrum as soon as it was available, and began writing the follow-up, or so it was claimed, for both machines. Work on this had started months before on paper though. The Black Crystal 
released on ZX81 and Spectrum, was a mammoth game, supplied on two cassettes containing seven different sections. The Spectrum version was almost a direct copy of the ZX81 game, with character style graphics and only a bit of colour to separate it. It was also written in BASIC, so key presses were slow and gameplay stifled. That didn't stop it being popular with fans though, especially those that liked adventure and Dungeons and Dragons. The various stages covered different elements in the journey, starting with a map where you had to move around, locate rings and engage in real-time fights. The fights were difficult to master, with numerous keys to remember and lots of monsters attacking you. From the map you can get to other areas, each one having to be loaded from tape and requiring the correct passcode. Areas included the Castle of Shadows, the Shagoth's Lair, the Temple of the Fire Demon and the Tower of Beroth. The first map also had sub-areas such as the Sea of Sand, the Gold Mine and the Room of Pits. For the game they decided to create a whole new world, the Third Continent, in which to set it, taking inspiration obviously from Tolkien. The aim of the Black Crystal was to find seven rings of creation, sound familiar? And then use them to destroy the evil Black Crystal itself. The game was very popular, which meant money was now coming into the company, but also meant Roy and Stuart were struggling to keep up with demand as they were still working in the film industry. It seems then that they pushed out Volcanic Dungeon for the Spectrum a few months later, again being an almost direct copy of the ZX81 game. It was text only and you had to collect weapons and armour and work out which of the many monsters they would work best on to finally rescue the princess trapped by the evil witch Magra, and we'll come back to her later. The game used random routines to place things differently each game, but did suffer from several major problems. The first, if you lost a game by getting killed, the game stopped, dropped you back into basic and told you you had to reload it from scratch. That's another five minutes of waiting. Another issue was that if you moved away from the game map, which was kindly included in the manual, you died and again you had to load the game from scratch. And that is a really bad game mechanic. The game proved difficult for most people and even the winner of the Volcanic Dungeon Championship took nearly an hour to complete it. During this time they also hinted at the third game in the series called The Wrath of Magra, with fans of the two previous games eager to play it. In October 1983, they launched full-page adverts, boasting a host of new games coming soon. These were The Adventures of St. Bernard, Star Force One, The Devil Rides In, The Crypt, as well as their previous title Black Crystal, and finally Wrath of Magra was marked as coming soon. So let's take a look at some of these games then. Firstly, The Adventures of St. Bernard. This was a step away from adventure games and a step into the world of, well, to be honest, crap games. The game was advertised as an exciting, fast-moving machine code arcade game that saw you guiding your St. Bernard across icy landscapes to rescue a woman from the abominable snowman. Nice cover, as with most Carnell games. However, the game, yes, and this is the game, no, it's not a joke. There are multiple levels, this being the first one, and here you just have to move your dog left or right to scare off the wolves. Exciting, isn't it? If your dog gets killed, it just flips upside down for no reason I can discern. The first level then is just sitting here stabbing left and right for a while. A sort of slow version of Daily Thompson's Decathlon. The next level, if you can stay awake that long, has your dog jumping over holes in the ice with walruses popping up. How the hell do you do this? Here I have infinite life set and I still can't get past these things. This is just impossible. Apparently there are other levels too, and to be honest, I didn't want to see them. There's no sound, the animation is okay I suppose, but nothing special, and the game is very painful to play. I think we should move on. Star Force 1. Take on the robot guardians of the central computer in a superbly styled battle game. This game was never released sadly, so we'll never see how good it was. On to The Devil Rides In then, and again a move away from adventures. This was also claimed to be a fast moving, machine code all action game. Again, nice cover, sort of, not as good as some of the others though. The plot has you as a wizard in a battle with the legions of hell, and you are held within a magic circle and must not touch the sides. There are six levels to the game. The first one, well, you just shoot the ghosts as they meander about, really. 
they do fire back and you have to avoid this. However, if you watch carefully, you'll notice that all their shots gravitate towards the centre of the screen. The graphics are crude but smooth, and the sound is a bit dull. Level 2 is much the same, this time with smaller spiders weaving a web to protect the larger ones, and again you just dodge and shoot. Once you get rid of the smaller spiders, you have to wait ages for the larger ones to come in line with your fire, all the time dodging their shots of course. Initially I thought this level was designed so you couldn't get any further. I had infinite lives set here, and I set the emulator running at 28 megahertz. and as you can see the spiders are just not coming into my line of fire. However, I then read the instructions and found that the 9 key rotates your wizard, and this made things a little bit easier. However, you still have to wait to line up your shots with the spiders that move very slowly. The next levels sound pretty cool with the Angel of Death astride a winged stallion, and some winged demons to shoot as well. But the gameplay is much the same, just with different enemy patterns. Sometimes the game slows down so much it's impossible not to die. Good job I had infinite lives set. Christmas 1983 arrived, and Carnell were throwing money into advertising. They had adverts in most of the major magazines at the time, hoping to cash in on the festive season. The first game to get released in 1984 was The Crypt. The Crypt had them back in the adventure market again, or so you would have thought reading the advert. The idea is that you have to fight your way through various crypts, looking for a sacred crucifix. To do this you have to first collect a sword or weapon, then bump into a monster until it's dead, and then check for treasure, and then move on. The game is painfully slow. This footage I'm holding the movement key down continuously, so you can see how the character jerks around. The graphics are bad, and the sound is below average. If you do manage to kill a monster, then fireballs appear, so you have to escape the room pretty quickly. Every so often you get a blood cell attack, and here you press the number keys that represent the column the bat is flying down. No need for this at all. In some rooms you come across a cyclops, and if you don't press the P key, you die. I did find the crucifix once, and then took it back to Crypt 1, as per the instructions, and nothing happened. I repeated this just to make sure, and just found that I got another blood cell attack, and then the game took me back to Crypt 26. Hmm, not very good. The adverts continued, but there seemed to be a slowdown in games releases. Popular Computing Weekly produced a book about writing adventure games called Spectrum Adventures, a guide to playing and writing adventure. Included in it was a typing, but if you couldn't be bothered you could get it on a tape. The game was called The Eye of the Star Warrior, and was written by Roy Carnell and Tony Bridge, the adventure columnist for the magazine. It was never released on its own, and it was a one-time deal only with the book. Once the game is loaded, it takes ages to set up the dungeon, but eventually we get into it. Your stats are displayed on the right, and the small area used to show the current room, and a little man on the left. Using the cursor keys you move about, and if you see something, you have to walk over it, and then type a command such as take. This makes progress very slow. Entering a room with a monster will give you a chance to run around it, or fight it if you think you have the right weapons and armour. If you don't have any weapons at all at this point, I suggest running away. Now this mechanic sounds very similar to other games like Volcanic Dungeon and The Crypt, especially in the fighting sequences, where you are asked which item you want to attack with and which item you want to defend with. The things then play out and you either die or kill the monster, very similar to Volcanic Dungeon in that respect. In one instance, I didn't have any weapons, so I pressed enter and the spectrum reset. Mm. So I avoided doing that again. Playing the game for some time and it actually began to grow on me though. It was a sort of cross between Volcanic Dungeon and Oracle's Cave. You collect the weapons and use them in combat, moving through the rooms trying to find the eye. It's a pity it's so slow, but it is written in basic after all. And after a while, I began to enjoy it. Moving on, and eventually the Wrath of Magra was released. Canel hoped it would be a big hit and help their diminishing finances. The game came with a supplied book, The Book of Shadows, which is very difficult to find nowadays. Then the game takes us back to their adventuring roots. The hero from Volcanic Dungeon is taken to the cells by an old wizard, only to find his beloved Edora, the woman he rescued in that game, chained to a wall and possessed by the witch Magra. Magra had been brought back to life and now seeks revenge for her own death at the hands of this man. 
Your task then is to find and destroy Magra again. The game is a run-of-the-mill graphic adventure in the most traditional style. It's in three parts, and I seem to recall this was written using the quill. However, the way in which the location graphics are drawn seems to make me think otherwise now. The game map is very much in the style of Carnell, a typical grid with exits to all sides except external walls. Some locations have buildings in them to enter, but the speed of drawing lets the game down. The first problem is finding something to drink. You are told you are thirsty, and if you don't discover how to quench your thirst, you die. Wandering about and trying normal things like open sarcophagus causes death, so it's an unforgiving game. There's also a lack of optimization. Usually adventure games shorten the words to the first four letters. So taking the previous example, open S-A-R-C would work on a normal game, but not in this game you have to type out the full thing. The game also holds a variety of swear words in its vocabulary, and using these reduces your health. The game is nothing special really, and that was borne out by the sales. It didn't do as well as Carnell hoped, and the company were struggling to survive. Eventually, it got too much, and in June 1984, Carnell Software was put into liquidation. There was still hope, though, as Carnell were expecting to strike a deal with another publisher to allow them to continue selling and producing games. A month later in July, and it was announced that Mastertronic had struck a deal to sell Magra and Black Crystal, effectively taking over Carnell. However, it was not certain about their other games or whether they would be part of the deal. Mastertronic set up a new label, Innovision, later changed to Mastervision, to sell the two aforementioned games at their original retail price. Also, part of the deal would see Stuart and Roy writing other adventure games for the label. One of their first releases was an upgraded version of Volcanic Dungeon, which included graphics and a new font. The game played exactly the same as the original release, but it didn't come in the large box and added manual like before. Some news stories claimed that the first release was Wrath of Magra, but the game was put out on the Carnell packaging, unlike subsequent Master Vision titles. The last in the Third Continent series was to be Legacy of Light, but this game never materialised. Whilst under the Master Trike label, they wrote Sinbad and the Golden Ship, released in 1986, seemingly their last venture into computer gaming. The game is a text and graphic adventure that looks to be using a much better engine than previous games. The graphics are drawn quickly, but the text input is a bit slow, often entering the wrong thing because the game simply can't keep up. The location graphics are okay, and do change when things happen, and the opening puzzle gives enough clues to get you started. Items are not immediately visible though, and you have to search every location, which is not only a bad mechanic, but also slows the pace down. The location exits are also not included in the text description, so you have to keep trying different directions until you find one you want. Another bad mechanic. Some commands are very limiting too. To get off the ship, for example, you can't go down, you can't climb down, you can't go see, you have to dive. As a whole though, the game is fairly nice to play with adequate graphics and long gameplay. Probably their best graphic adventure. Carnell Software ceased to be in July 1984, lasting three years and seven months. They left behind games that you either loved or hated, but all with excellent packages. The earlier titles were very distinctive in their cardboard box, and later the blue clamshell games were looked excellent. The game quality varied, with some never actually making it to market, but for early adventure fans, Carnell Software will still live on. The wackiest miniature golf game in the world! So the inlay states for Accolades Mini Putt, released in 1987. At least that's what the cassette says, despite claiming 1988 on some websites. Now there are several Mini Putt and golf games for the Spectrum, and most don't come up to scratch, and I suppose fairly so, based on the hardware they're running on. The instructions are quite lengthy, which takes away the simplicity of the game for me, but let's have a go anyway. When you load it, there are four courses to play, Classic, Deluxe, Traditional and Challenge. And let's take a look at Traditional first then. The game gives us the usual, if limited, obstructions here. There are arrows that move the ball in certain directions and certain speeds. There are narrow bridges, trees, and if you play far enough, a windmill and an elephant. 
play your shot, you move the cursor to where you want the ball to go, press fire and wait for the power meter to get to the right level, press fire again, and then try to get the horizontal bar as close as you can to the middle marker, for a straight shot. The ball will then go flying off in the direction you choose, at the speed you choose, hopefully, and with a bit of luck you'll get it right. And this is where the problem is. Because most of the holes are split across two screens, you can't see what's at the other side, and the map in the middle at the bottom is absolutely no use whatsoever. You could fire the ball straight across, in what you hope would be the general direction of the hole, and find yourself stuck in a river, which is a terrible mechanic. Your little golfer will snap his club in half if you get something wrong, like get the ball in the water, or if you complete the hole on par, will raise his club above his head in triumph. If, however, you go over par, he'll just smash his head to the ground. The graphics, as you can see, are bland. There's no texture and a stuttering animation, and, of course, lifeless scenery. Sound is, well, absent, really. Nothing at all, which is a major letdown. For a game that is this complex, there are issues. I have, for example, hit the ball so hard off the screen that it appeared in another course altogether, and then got stuck. And in the first screen, if you get the ball at a right angle, it will get stuck in the scenery anyway. I couldn't get the game to work on plus 2 or plus 3 machines, it can only work on emulation in 1 to 8 or plus 2A models, and I've no idea why. Most of the other courses continue in the same vein, with very little scenery, and if there is some, it's a bit dull and lifeless and some of the problems around tricky shots in holes continue on to the other courses. Here is one from Classic, and I had no idea how to get to the hole. There seems to be a white bit in the wall, but your ball just bounces off it. I tried hitting it off the cannon, and nothing happened. Very confusing. Eventually, though, I tried hitting the ball into the cannon, and that worked. So it seems that this game is a bit of a guess-where-to-hit-the-ball game. As a whole, then, the game relies too much on arrows for the ball control. So where are the hills? Where's the bumpy ground, the tunnels, the clowns, and the rest of the things that are familiar? Sound would have made a difference to the whole game, I think, and a bit more variety, and better scenery. But overall, an average game that should have been much, much better, especially for 1987. This is Trom from DK Tronics, released in 1983. A simple idea that looks like several other titles of this time, for example Transversion from Ocean, but the game plays totally differently. Your aim is to collect the bits, one at a time, those are the things in the corners, and then drop them into the furnace. To do this safely, you have to move across at the top of the fire, instead of going down from above. And when the fire turns red, the bit has been dropped successfully. There are bites moving around the outside of the screen that fire at you from time to time. And there are snake-like things called nibbles that move around and get in your way. Bits, bites and nibbles. Yes, it's set in a computer world, just like Tron the movie from where this game gets its inspiration, obviously.
The tricky part is getting close enough to drop the bits into the furnace. If you get too close, you'll crash and burn yourself. The graphics are average for this era, and the sound just consists of basic like beeps. Things move in character squares too, but at least the control of your ship is quite crisp. It's not a bad game, and certainly challenging as each level is complete, with more nibbles and bites added. One worth a look then if you like this style of game. It's time to look at some utility software, although this could fit into the education category too. This is Map of the UK, released by Kumar Computers in 1983. After reading five pages of instructions, you get to the map itself, though you would be pushed to see any part of the map on screen because it's full of text. You can move around in various size jumps using the cursor keys. And you can also search for a location, for example, Manchester. If you want to get the distance between two places, let's try, I don't know, Manchester and Edinburgh, you just enter both locations and the program will do the rest. It will show you the distance in miles and kilometres, and also the longitude and latitude of the locations. And that about concludes things. There is something called a quick scan, and this scrolls the map across in slices, working as it goes up. But it's far easier to navigate yourself. There's also a small balloon game, but to be honest, it's rubbish. Now I could see this being used in classrooms as a learning aid, but it would have benefited from a zoom out function allowing you to see where in the UK the actual places were. I suppose the resolution of the spectrum had its limitations, but I think this piece of software could have been much better. <laughs>